Hey, Ambassador Stephen Robinson of the Embassy of Australia, and with him for support, Claire <laughs> Duffield. <laughs> uh, I'm also joined today by Bernadette Amaya, our, our senior reporter uh, covering the Department of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador, welcome to Manila Times. To the Thank Manila you. Times. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here with you. you you've been here only eight months, and, and yet you have been so busy. And I, I, one of the latest things that uh, we understand that, that you did was you went back to Australia for a series of briefings and meetings. Yeah. Um, maybe let's, let's start off there. Tell us sure. what's the latest from Australia. Sure. So uh, I've just come back last Thursday from uh, a whole series of meetings down in Australia. It was called the Global Heads of Missions Meeting, when the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs brings back all its heads of mission and heads of post from around the world. So there were about 112 of us that got together in Canberra to talk about our particular bilateral relationships, uh, but also to hear from the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister and the Minister for Trade about where the government's headed and how we should best represent Australia's interests overseas. Mm -hmm. So it was a fascinating period. It also gave me the opportunity too to engage with the Filipino community uh, because there's so many Filipinos down in Australia at the current time. So I had a couple of meetings with them as well. Wow. wow. Bernadette? Ambassador, could you please uh, update us on our trade relations with Australia? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So Australia has got a, a sound relationship with the Philippines in terms of trade. But at the end of the day, when you do comparisons between where Australia sits with other countries in Southeast Asia mm. and ASEAN, as against the Philippines, the Philippines is further down the scale uh, than others. So in terms of trading relationships, the Philippines sits at, a, at about number 23 in terms of Australia's trading relationships, whereas with other countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, it sits around 8 to 12. And to me, that doesn't make a great deal of sense. Our trade with the Philippines should be much higher and should be much stronger. And currently it sits at a bit under $5 billion a year. Is that US? Yeah, well, okay. I think it's Australian dollars. Australian dollars. Uh, okay. $5 billion. Uh, a year, um, and it should be appreciably larger than that, given where the Australian economy is at, and particularly where the Philippine economy is at, and where it's forecast to go. So I think there's enormous opportunity both for Australians to invest in the Philippines, but also for Filipinos to invest in Australia. Mm. And over my time here as ambassador, that's one of the things that I'm really keen to give a major push. And right. See if I can improve. Can, can we start on with with the trade? Yeah. Um, what what are the major things that that, that so, buy and sell from each so other? So if you look at what Australia sells to the Philippines, it's wheat and precious metals. Oh. Wheat and precious metals. They're the two biggest things that we sell. And then if you look at what the Philippines sells to Australia, it's actually gold, which is really interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, and then also. Um, electrical equipment right. and that's of course what the precious metals go to assist in, in uh, producing. So that's all well and good but there's so much more to our relationship particularly when you look at the businesses that are already here in the Philippines right. and what they're doing right. um, because that covers pretty much the full gamut from mining operations right through to BPOs and mm -hmm. a whole range of education uh, <coughs> elements as well mm -hmm. and we should be able to lift the whole trade relationship between us. All right. Now I, I understand that Australia is a is a major source of agricultural products besides the ones that you yep. that you mentioned. Yep. Uh, so dairy and beef dairy, obviously beef yeah, and lamb, cheese and yep, all of that wine. Too. Yeah wine is increasing which is wonderful because mm -hmm. I'm a great advocate for Australian <laughs> wine. Uh, I like I like Australian wine a lot and Filipinos seem to have the taste for Australian wine which is tremendous. So we've got a number of uh, importers now bringing Australian wine to the Philippines. And uh, what makes your products um, I ah, suppose better than say the ones coming from the US or so, from, from Europe? Or? Well, when it comes to wine, wine is robust and okay. it travels well okay. uh, and it's relatively inexpensive as against many of the, the items that you'd see from Europe or the United from, States. From farther so, away. So yeah. we're highly competitive and it's good quality for a reduced price um, and you can trust it. Mm. Uh, so, and it's got a taste that I think matches the Filipino palate. Um, so we've got some robust reds, we've got some really succulent whites and uh, I think it goes really well with the <laughs> Filipino food. Oh, incidentally, the news of the day is this 
the swine flu thing. Is there are there opportunities there, so, maybe to, to for Australia to supply more so I th <coughs> pork to I th the Philippines? Well, mm, I don't know about the supply of pork, okay. but to assist in the eradication of swine flu. Okay. Um, so actually, yesterday I went out to the uh, to the Quezon City uh, Mayor and met. Uh, Mayor Belmonte, mm -hmm. uh, and she was talking about swine flu and the, the impact that it's having on her city. Um, and this, of course, you know, these, these diseases Australia combats as well. And so maybe there's some opportunities there to assist the Philippines in, in dealing with swine flu. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the things that we can think about in terms of you know, the cooperation between us. Mm. Yeah. You, you mentioned that the, when you were in Australia, you met with the local Filipino yeah. community or the, yeah. the Filipino Australians. Uh, um, in, in, my impression is that Australia has opened up quite a bit over the past ah, past few decades, but it hasn't always been like that. What's what, so, why the change? So uh, I, I think well, I'd, I'd always say that Australia has been pretty open. You okay. know, if you go back in the last thirty or forty years, Australia has become one of the models for multi multicultural societies, mm -hmm. uh, because we've got people from all over the world uh, now settled in in our country and calling themselves Australians. Right. So the thing I find fascinating is you walk down the streets of Sydney and you look at all the people and you can't, you could not say, well, this is identifiably any country right. because they're of from, all all over. from all over the world. Yeah. And, you know, but if you talk to them and ask them, who are you? They'll say, well, I'm a, an Australian first but I'm of Filipino extraction, or I'm an Australian first and I come from the Vietnam, or I'm Australian first and I come from China. Oh, yeah. um, all of that is just quite extraordinary. And of course, Filipinos have been a major part in Australia's history, uh, because when you look at the contact between the Philippines and Australia, it goes back to the late 1800s, oh, when, oh, really? yeah, when Filipinos far, yeah. went down to actually get involved in our pearling industry oh, uh, okay. and worked on the luggers out of yeah. yeah worked on the luggers out of Western Australia. There was also some trade back in the late 1800s with Queensland, uh, and looking at you know coffee and other bits and pieces uh, that came down from the Philippines to Queensland. So it's a long-standing relationship. But oh, over wow. the last 30 years. Um, it has really lifted. It's really grown. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's grown enormously. And so the thing that I found incredible when I was learning about the Philippines uh, to come to this post was just where the Philippines diaspora and the Philippines population in Australia stood in comparison to others. And it's the fifth largest ethnic grouping in Australia. Really? So after, after the UK, China, New Zealand mm -hmm. and India, the Filipinos are the fifth largest grouping. And so we've got about you know, 304,000 Filipinos now living in Australia, and that number is growing remarkably mm. fast. Uh, every year, more and more people move down and you know, settle in Australia. And when you walk out here, one of the things I find fantastic uh, about Manila, you go out and you engage people and you say, well, have you got some sort of connection mm -hmm. to Australia? Virtually everyone will tell you that they've got a cousin or a nephew or a relative that's down in Australia and that they go down and see them regularly. And so that's, that's interesting. That, it's really good. The, the thing that's, I think, really brought it on beyond the, the proximity mm -hmm. and the fact that we have similar values and similar approaches to life, you know, we both enjoy a laugh, we both enjoy good food, we like a bit of fun. Um, you know, Filipinos and Australians have a lot that, you know, makes us kind of come together, is the education piece. So, you know, I've been looking at the, the growth in education between Philippines and Australia over the last few years, and the numbers of Filipinos going down to Australia are quite extraordinary. So, uh, when we do comparisons with where uh, Filipinos go to study, we're now the number one draw card really? uh, in the world. So we've overtaken you know, the, US, the, yeah. Yeah, the US and Canada, uh, much to their surprise, I think, as a draw card. And so this year alone, there's nearly 13,000 Filipinos studying in Australia, wow. which is pretty remarkable. And so that, that really adds to the bonds between us, because if you go down and do a three or four year university course, right. Or, or a vocational training course. You know, some of the pilots from Cebu Pacific are actually being trained in yeah, Adelaide. Uh, so all the pilots are being trained in Adelaide, which I find uh, pretty spectacular too. But when you look at all of that, that really builds 
the bonds between our communities uh, because people come back to the Philippines with an Australian degree and then they apply many of the things they've learned in Australia to the Philippines. What, what I found interesting, I, th yeah. thank you by the way for inviting me to visit your country. Yeah, no, <laughs> not at all. But I, I noticed, which is I, I, I didn't see it in the US or elsewhere, that how, how open your schools are to Filipino academics. Sure. There are sure. Qu quite a few, which, which was surprising. Yeah. I mean, I was pleasantly surprised yeah. about it. Well, we, we actually want to do more. And one of the things that I did when I was down in Australia last week was talk to our universities about the links between right. Australian universities and, and Philippine, Philippine universities. universities. And that was really good because I went to three universities in Sydney, uh, the University of Technology, uh, which already has some links with Filipino universities. Uh, Macquarie University, Macquarie. which has very substantial linkages uh, with Filipino universities, Ateneo, the University of the Philippines, mm -hmm. and others. Uh, and then I also went out to Western Sydney University. And they're all looking at the Philippines as a source, both of students coming to them, but a source of partnership for the future. I see. Because they see the utility of forming agreements between the universities for exchange of lecturers, which goes to your point very much. Right. Uh, how, do we, how do we share lecturers? How do we share curricula? Um, so Carnegie Mellon, which is a university that's based in Adelaide, okay. just signed an MOU uh, with, with De La Salle University, and I went to that. And there's many oh, wow. other agreements like that that are springing up right across the board. And that's, of course, really important to us. All right, well, keep, keep us in mind if you have something yeah. for journalism. Well, <laughs> well yeah, I think it's highly, highly likely because we have our journalist courses down in Australia are first rate. So the other bit that goes to those linkages are some of the awards that Australia offers to Filipinos. And there's a, oh, okay. a terrific thing called the Australia Awards, to give it a plug. Okay. And, and each year we have up to 100 Filipinos who win scholarships to go and study in Australia. And this is generally second or third degrees, either masters or PhDs. And they go down and do those uh, degrees down in Australia uh, for a period around two years or so. Okay. And that is just fantastic. And that's funded by the Australian government. And often their families go with them uh, and they uh, spend that time in Australia. And then they come back and they give back to the Philippines based on the, the study that they've undertaken. I was going to say, I mean, that, that would yeah. be problematic for brain drain, but I'm, there's, no, there's really actually good. a program. So there's a program, yeah. so there's a program actually to, for, the, for the students to come back and give and to, to the Philippines. So we, uh, yesterday morning actually, I went out to uh, Kazon City and there were 43 uh, awardees who had just returned. Wow. And they're drawn from a range of government, uh, NGOs, private businesses uh, who have studied in Australia for a period of time doing masters or PhDs who are now coming back to the Philippines and joining wow. up with their families. Yeah. And part of the scholarship that we, we have them undertake makes them make a commitment to giving back to the Philippines. That's so great. when they come back, there's a three-month period where they have to actually undertake a period of work that transfers knowledge that they've gained from Australia to a particular benefit here in the Philippines. That's fantastic. And I think, I think it's really good. And it's one of the things about this award program that's now being picked up by other missions right, right around the world. Right. Uh, where Australia offers similar scholarships because it's such a good thing to do. Are, are there specific areas of study that, that you prioritise, say science and technology? So, or? so not really. It, it goes to particular areas of need. Okay. You know, so, so you know, most students focused on where does the Philippines need to I develop see. its skill set and they're thinking about their future but also the future of the Philippines. So it can be pretty much across the board right, and right. it's not confined to any particular universities on the eastern coast, it can be anywhere in Australia. I so see. there's a real broad cross-section of universities, University of Queensland, University of Wollongong, all the universities in Sydney, Melbourne University, ANU in Canberra. So it was uh, terrific. So it was lovely to meet these people yesterday because <laughs> they're so, so excited uh, about having completed their degree in Australia, but then coming back to the Philippines uh, to be with their families, but then right. to use that knowledge uh, right. to take things forward in terms of Philippines development. So right. it's good. Yeah, oh, really good. Wow. Bring it. Yeah.
Ambassador, we uh, talked about um, trade uh, a while ago. Yeah. How about investments? Are there new investments coming from... Yeah, so, so there are indeed investments being made here. And when you look at the companies that are here in the Philippines, we've got over 300 Australian companies here now okay. based in the Philippines, which is pretty significant. And some of our biggest companies and biggest investors are here. So the Macquarie Group, which is one of the largest uh, companies down in Australia in terms of investment, uh, is here and has been here for a long period of time. QBE Insurance is here. The ANZ Bank is here. Mm -hmm. Qantas obviously is here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole range of very substantial Australian firms looking at opportunities in the Philippines and investing broadly. And then there's a, a range of other Australian companies going from, as I mentioned before, mining mm -hmm. right across to BPOs, mm -hmm. who are also looking at how can they leverage the development of the Philippines. Because as the Philippines is booming, you know, its economy is booming. You know, when I arrived here and I went and spoke to the World Bank and the IMF, mm -hmm. they tell you that the economy of the Philippines, its GDP rate of growth, is going to be at least 6 to 7% a year for the next decade. You know, that is just extraordinary. And any country, you know, would be mad not to take advantage of mm -hmm. that potential growth. So what we're looking towards is how does Australia, you know, get its businesses to engage with the Philippines to assist in upping that trade, but also taking part in the, the transformation of the Philippines. You know, the President's Build, Build, Build program mm -hmm. and all that focus on infrastructure just offers so much to Australia. And so we've got companies that can readily assist in all of that. And as I reach out to you know, many of the Philippine conglomerates and the large families here that underpin uh, business in the Philippines, mm -hmm. many of them, to my surprise, have already reached out to Australia looking oh. at how can they use Australian nous, ingenuity, innovation, mm -hmm. to assist them with the projects that they've indeed won from government as part of the President's Build, Build, Build program. Mm. So we've got lots of Australian companies here doing things in conjunction with Philippine companies, some of the largest Philippine companies uh, in the country, uh, building expressways, building bits of the airports, doing things with the ports. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear about that because they're not the companies that are up front, High profile, but the uh, ones that are behind them that are underpinning all of that development are indeed Australian. Mm -hmm. So how can I do more of that? How can I get more Australian companies involved? So I interestingly had a session down in Sydney last week where I got together, you know, sponsored by you know, SGV's counterpart in Australia, okay. uh, 40 Australian businesses to talk to those businesses about the Philippines and the opportunities that exist here and to actually have some of the companies that are already operating here talk about the benefits of you know, being in the Philippines. And when you do a comparison between the Philippines and Vietnam and India, many of the companies that are cited as potential, you know, competitors, if you like, to mm -hmm. draw investment and interest, you know, the Philippines stacks up really well. And, you know, the, the companies that are here would say the nature of the Philippines people, their, their service mentality, their warmth, their approach to, to life, the fact that they're English speaking, the quality of the education here in the Philippines just means that there are so many opportunities for companies mm -hmm. to, to utilise a very educated, uh, highly focused Philippine workforce you know, to deliver outcomes for them. Right. You know, all the Australian companies that are here basically say to me, you know, you're mad if you're not here <laughs> because you know, the Philippines is such a great place mm -hmm. in which to, to operate. So that's really positive. So I want to right. build on all of that, right. and hopefully the presentation I gave last week uh, to Australian businesses will entice some more to come up here. What are some of the industries that you think are, are, are ripe for, for Australian investments? Well, I, think I know you've only been here eight so months, no, but no, you've no, been... It's a, it's a very fair question, yeah. uh, because what, what, where is Australia's competitive edge, I suppose, is I the real, real push. Okay. You know, what would I say? You know, there, there's obviously some things that go to the infrastructure piece, right. uh, which goes to power generation, roads, railways, ports, all of those things, and Australia can do all of that. Right. But if you look at where Australia sits in comparison to other countries, right. um, you know, and there's many countries that are pouring large amounts of funds into the Philippines, whether it be China, the United States, Japan, South Korea, 
where does Australia actually get the competitive edge? And I think that comes to science, technology and innovation. Okay. Because we're a small country but with a dynamic economy. But the government has cleverly invested in areas that make us have an edge. So okay. back in Australia, you know, the CSIRO, so the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation okay. that I called on last week, as a matter of fact, um, is doing some of the, the cutting edge work uh, that really provides opportunities. The Wi-Fi is an Australian invention. Wow. That comes out of Australia. Can you um, make it faster in the Philippines? So, <laughs> yeah, I think we can. And I, think, I think there's a way we can do that. Google Maps yeah. comes out of Australian innovation. Yeah. So you look at all of that and then you think about, well, what about green energy? What about renewable energy? All of those right. things are right. on offer in Australia and we've got the nous to be able to contribute to the Philippines' development. So yeah. that's where I think we need to go. Well, um, what are some of the things that, that, that can be done on the Philippine side that you think that can make our country more attractive? Because, you know, there, there is, yeah. as you said, a saying, you know, yeah. and we, in a sense, we are competing with, with you know, with, with our neighbors. Yeah. And some of them are, you know, well, frankly speaking, doing better than, yeah. than we are in drawing well, your, your, I, your I'm, investments. I'm an optimist, right? Yeah. I'm always an optimist. And, yeah. and when I look at the economic reforms that are occurring in the Philippines, mm -hmm. I think that is really positive. Okay. You know, so I, I look at the, the things that have been undertaken over the last few years and many of the reforms that have taken place in terms of the economy and what that offers for the future. It's like the uh, Train 2 okay. uh, piece that's going through the Congress at the current time. Okay. You know, what does an Australian business want? It wants clarity, consistency, it wants okay. certainty. Any business wants those things. Right. And so once these, these economic reforms go through the Congress and you know what you're dealing with, you can make decisions. That, that's interesting. You so can it's make not, decisions. It's not either or, but really the consistency of the uh, policy. It, that, it's that it's so consistency in its, in its application, understanding what it means for the future. Right. So you can make decisions for your business right. and, and, you know, uh, scale up accordingly. Right, so, right, right. so that's what all business wants. You know, we've got a tremendous Australian New Zealand Chamber of Commerce here, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very active. It, it's right across the community. It represents a whole range of Australian businesses. And what they say to me is precisely that, consistency, clarity, certainty. Mm -hmm. If you give us all of that, we'll deal with whatever comes from right. the government, but that will enable us to make the key decisions to set our business up for the future. Right. But if I go back to the, the underlying point of all of this, is I think the reforms that have been made economically in mm -hmm. the country over recent years have actually been to the country's great benefit. If I talk to, for example, and I have been doing this, uh, with a whole range of uh, Filipino business leaders, you know, they will say, you know, on balance, no one's 100% happy. You know, that's just an impossibility. We're all sure. never 100% sure. happy. But if you look at the, the way in which the economy is being reformed, um, the government gets a pretty good tick. You know, you'd say that it's you know, much, much more positive than negative. And so that offers great opportunities uh, for not only the country and its you know, local businesses, but also for foreign investors coming in here. Uh, are, are your companies also looking at the Philippines as, as an entry point to ASEAN? Is there, in other words, is there an, an ASEAN <clears throat> perspective so, or a strategy so that, that it, you're I th looking I think, at? Or? I think it depends, okay. it depends on the company. You know, I see. It, it goes company by company. Some, I of see. Them, some of them are taking a broader perspective, others are just focused on the Philippines. I see. Um, it, it's hard to generalise and I, right. I don't think that's, right. that's fair if I did that. Um, so I think it depends on each company's uh, particular interests. But where they've had experience in the past with Filipino firms, that's an incentive to come back. So you know, we've been talking to the uh, International uh, Container Terminals Services ICTSI? Yeah, right. Okay. <coughs> ICTSI, uh, just in recent days. And looking at their experience, because they run the most computerised, high-tech port in Australia, down in Melbourne. In Melbourne, yeah. Yes. So uh, Enrique Rizon's you know, company down there has got a tremendous uh, business going down in Melbourne ports. The Australian companies that worked with you know, his, his uh, group 
uh, to set up that port are now here in the Philippines working with him, thinking about what are the options for the future wow. and looking at, you know, Filipino ports and much of the infrastructure here. So very, very positive. And that experience that they had in Australia with his company has enticed them to come here and uh, continue their work. So I think mm. it looks really good for the future. Well, I, I know that, you know, that, that investments flowing to Australia is your counterparts job but you know maybe yeah. can you share with us some of the things so, that you think are so the areas that are right for Philippine investments so other I, than ICTSI? So yeah the, well there's lots um, and it does go to the science and technology piece mm. you know like uh, San Miguel for example is oh, doing okay. really well down in Australia uh, having you had, like our beer, don't you? I, I do like your beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as you can tell, uh, it, it's had an impact on me. Uh, uh, so, yeah, they are they are doing really well down in Australia, you know, particularly in terms of bottling uh, bottling operations uh, down there. You know, which supports the wine industry, which is another good thing. Uh, but but talking to San Miguel about their broadening of their investments. Uh, in Australia, they're looking at lots of different opportunities. But San, they, San Miguel is not a new in, <coughs> investor in Australia. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's been around for a while. For a while, now. Yeah. Uh, And you know, they've been testing the market, seeing what works, what what's best fit for them. Right. And they've got a very entertaining plan, which I won't go into because that's commercial <laughs> inconfidence about where where they want to go. Right. But, but I think that means a very significant uh, increase in their investment in Australia, and that's all to the good. Um, and I think there's many other firms that are doing exactly the same. Uh, so when I've gone around and I've spoken to the key families and the key conglomerates, they've all got an eye on Australia, mm. thinking about, well, not only enticing Australian firms to partner with us here in the Philippines, mm -hmm. but where could we potentially invest in Australia? Mm. And energy goes to a large part of it. The, really? the, the, the port facilities, you know, I think they are really quite key. Infrastructure in Australia itself, you know, because we're looking at railways and the government's currently okay. on quite a, a significant push uh, right. to develop our own rail industry, right. uh, rail network. Yeah. Where did that? Uh, Ambassador, I believe our governments have a strong defense and military yeah. Is there any development on our uh, yeah. terrorism yeah. operation? Yeah, that's a that's a good question because you know when I look at how how do we define the relationship between the Philippines and Australia, I think it is underpinned by the defence, security, and intelligence ties that we have, mm. and so the the defence ties are of, are of long standing. You know, they go back to the to the Second World War when we fought together. Um, and they have continued over the last 70 years or so. And so, you know, particularly as a result of the Marawi siege back in 2017, Australia stepped up its commitment to the Philippines to help the Philippines Armed Forces deal with that frightful situation uh, down in Marawi. And as a consequence, we made commitments to the Philippines then, which continue to this day and I think will now continue pretty much indefinitely. And that went to a step up in our cooperation. Uh, and how can we help the Philippines Armed Forces you know, deal with counterterrorism issues and train its forces mm. to be prepared for any challenges that might be there in the future? So, so one of the great things that came from you know, that commitment back in 2017 was to send up a whole range of Australian Armed Forces personnel and we've got a lot here in the country working mm. with the Armed Forces of the Philippines on training and we've now trained nearly 8,000 uh, Filipino servicemen and women uh, in counter-terrorism techniques and I was fortunate enough to have the Chief of the Australian Defence Force here in June this year, General Angus Campbell and he had discussions with General Madrigal uh, about the future of our defence cooperation. And we've got a task force, Task Force 629, that's been working here uh, since 2017, uh, which provides that training. And it all takes place pretty much down in Pungadian. Um, and you know, there's a large group of Australian servicemen down there, servicemen mm. and women down there now. But looking at what does the future hold, and mm. one of the things that came from that visit, which answers your question, was that we decided that we'd maintain the commitment to the Philippines and that from the beginning of 2020, we'd have the joint Australian training team here in the Philippines on an ongoing basis. And that's continuing all of that training support that we provide now. 
and that's a very significant commitment from Australia and it goes to the bonds between our uh, defence and security uh, personnel. So I'm really very, very pleased about that, uh, right. very pleased to see that come, come together. Um, so that cooperation really is quite substantial and it also extends of course to the police and what we're doing security wise uh, with the police force because they're involved in counter-terrorism as well but also in some of the, the programs that they've got which go to uh, looking after children because uh, sexual online exploitation of kids is really a major problem for mm. Australia as it is for the Philippines mm. and so we've been working closely with the PNP uh, to try and deal with that and in February this year we set up a an online countering sexual exploitation centre in PNP headquarters and we've got a program called Safer Kids which extends out to 2026 mm. together with a range of agencies here the Australian Federal Police and the PNP uh, seeking to deal with this you know, awful situation that we have. Right. Well, Ambassador, going back to security cooperation, yeah, sure. I, I remember when, when, when you invited me to Australia, I was surprised at the level of concern with Marawi. Yeah. And, uh, and that this is not just yep. the Philippines yeah. problem, but you know, an ASEAN problem. It and is, an, it is. And an it Australian is. problem. Yeah, it is. Because for, for us, you know, the, Australia has lost more people in Southeast Asia to terrorism mm. uh, than to any other incident. Uh, You're talking about Bali year. and then Bali, the yeah, others. The Bali and, 1, Bali 2, yeah. the Marriott Hotel bombing in Indonesia, yeah. the bombing of the Australian Embassy itself in Jakarta right. going back a few years ago. And regrettably, many of the people who were involved in those bombings had spent time in the southern Philippines mm. and they had learnt their skills mm. uh, down there involved with a range of various groups. Mm. So the logic obviously is if we can work with the armed forces of the Philippines and the PNP to deal with the, the terrorist affiliates in the south of the Philippines that not only protects the Philippines but it also protects Australia and safeguards us from right. future threats elsewhere in Southeast Asia right. and after the you know the battles that occurred in Iraq and Syria where you know Asian foreign fighters started to return right. to Southeast Asia the potential for them to be drawn back to the southern Philippines if the terrorist situation in the south of the Philippines is not contained right. is, is a concern. Right. So, so therefore it's in Australia's interest to continue to work with the, the Philippines uh, to confront terrorism. Right, and in the short few months that you've been here, you've been to Marawi. I have, I've uh, been three times. Right, what, what are your, what's your reading of so, the situation on the ground? Uh, well, it's a really difficult situation, you know. I, I was uh, down in Australia when the Marawi siege was underway and assisting in some ways in providing support from Australia uh, to the armed forces as they dealt with that siege. Um, nothing really prepared me for going in there on the 14th of March, was the first time I went down there, to see the destruction mm. in, in the city. So, you know, as I understand, you know, Marawi is made up of 96 barangays, 24 of which are the most affected area. Mm -hmm. And as you go across the bridge into the most affected area and you see the devastation in that city, you can understand just how confronting and difficult that siege must have been. And if you were a member of the armed forces of the Philippines involved in that siege, when it got down to pretty much hand-to-hand -hand combat at the end of the siege uh, to finish off the terrorists, um, that must have been just frightful. So I was, I was actually quite shocked uh, by the extent of devastation uh, to the city. And so I came away kind of thinking, my goodness, uh, how does any government deal with that situation? Right. Because you've got such a large area that has indeed uh, completely destroyed, or pretty much so. And what do you do then to support the, the people uh, that mm -hmm. have been affected by that, by that siege? Well, back in 2017, when we saw the siege unfold, the government committed about $25 million uh, to the Philippines to support the people of Marawi. And that's been increased again this year by another $5 million, bringing it to $30 million Australian mm. dollars, which is about 1.2 billion pesos that we are now uh, using to support the reconstruction of the city and the support mm -hmm. given for the people who have been displaced because there's still large numbers of people displaced. Mm -hmm. So I went back again at the beginning of June and I took the Chief of the Defence Force with me uh, when we were, uh, went down to Marawi at the beginning of June 
Uh, by that stage, about 20% of the city had been uh, cleared, which was really quite surprising. And then I went again uh, uh, about a month or so ago, and there was about, um, coming up towards about 50% of the city, uh, the most affected area had been cleared. Now, that's, that's remarkable because there's some very significant issues in Marawi. Uh, actually working out who owns what bit of a which bit of land yeah, no, uh, and the unexploded ordnance that's still there right. from from the bombing raids that occurred back in 2017 so i think the government's made some significant progress in clearing the city and their estimate uh, its estimate of completion which is the end of november this year when the government would then start one of its 21 projects that it's got scheduled uh, to rebuild the city at least in terms of its administration centres uh, and other other elements uh, will get underway. So that's that's very positive. Uh, for the people who are still displaced, you know, there's always going to be great dissatisfaction uh, amongst amongst them with the speed with which the, the government can deal with the situation and how do they then get uh, recompense for the destruction of their homes. So there's lots of issues to be to be affected. Um, but for us, going back to your question about the terrorist situation, mm -hmm. the displaced people and the youth are obviously vulnerable. Sure. Vulnerable <clears throat> to terrorist approaches. And that's a concern. Prone to recruitment. Uh, uh, that's right. Yeah. That, that is quite true. And I think the armed forces of the Philippines would say the same. You know, there is a real focus. And General Browner, who's responsible for Marawi and mm -hmm. uh, the you know, uh, surrounding areas, is doing a terrific job. But they are, you know, legitimately concerned uh, about the situation down south. And so that means that we just need to step up our commitment and maintain our work uh, with the Philippines to confront terrorism. Right. Uh, so there's, it's an ongoing issue. It's not going to go away. Right. Uh, we're going to be here for the long term with the Philippines because that issue is going to be here, regrettably, on a long-term basis. Right. Um, right. So we just keep working together to try and do what we can to suppress it. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting you said, you know, the, the cooperation, the security cooperation between the Philippines and Australia is historic. You, yeah. you mentioned um, uh, the World War II. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there's an upcoming oh, yes. commemoration. Yeah. So that, that, that's right. So um, on the about the 20th of October this year, mm -hmm. we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Leyte, mm. uh, the biggest naval battle in the world's history. And so Australia was involved in that. So we're going up to Leyte together with our American friends. I think we're educating uh, our, uh, the public here. They, they forget yep. that no, well, Australia just, was in the picture. We they were, just remember we were, the Americans. We were, we've been there for a long time. <laughs> no, that's right. Australia's been here. It's our region. Yeah. You know, it really matters. Uh, yeah. This is this is where Australia lives. Yeah. So it really matters to us. So we're going up there at uh, on the 20th of October to commemorate that. And then the Battle of Surigao uh, a few days later. And hopefully I'll have some Australian naval ships up here to uh, commemorate those two uh, conflicts. But we've got a, uh, a display, an exhibition that we're going to mount here in Quezon City, opening on the 17th of October, uh, which is about not only the Battle of Leyte, uh -huh. but about the Australian-Philippines defence relationship, uh, what we've done over its history and where it's going into the future. Uh, so if anyone's out there who wants to go and have a look at an exhibition, uh, have a look uh, <laughs> up in Quezon City from the 17th of October because it'll be highly worthwhile. Well, it's sad because Filipinos, I, I, I don't think, really appreciate history as, as, mm. as much as we should. Right, we only remember MacArthur yeah. landing and so well, we forget well, he, all the other contributors. Well, MacArthur <laughs> came down to Australia, uh, so I, when, when I went across to uh, right. Corregidor right. uh, to have a look at uh, at where MacArthur left from, because he left from Corregidor and he went down to Melbourne, and so he was in one of the military barracks down in Melbourne, which is now a museum in itself. Oh, and he spent a lot of time down in Melbourne before he eventually came back. I will return, right. as he said. Right, right. Uh, so up there in Leto, where there's that fantastic monument uh, commemorating his return and walking up the beach, right. um, you know, through through the surf. <laughs> uh, yeah, we remember MacArthur uh, very well back right. in Australia. Well, maybe he enjoyed enjoyed Australia a little bit too much. He could have <laughs> come back sooner. <laughs> about that <laughs> yeah. well I, I hope you're not you know 
uh, working all of the time? I mean, uh, well, you seem to be Yeah, I do kind of work busy. a bit, but I like it. <laughs> I like it because, you know, how could you not? You know, the, the yeah. Philippines is such a great place. So I first came here, Clink, about 38 years ago wow. uh, when I was a university student, and I've been coming back pretty much ever since. And, you know, I've said this before, but it's, it's true. You know, when I was here the first time, uh, I was taken by the beauty of the place and just the warmth of the Philippines people. Um, and when I came back, you know, it's been terrific for my wife and I to come here and to live in, the, in Manila and to travel around the Philippines because the people are just so genuinely warm and friendly and embracing. You know, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here and also to look after an embassy that's about our sixth or seventh largest in the world. That's oh, a very significant that's thing. Yeah. yeah, because, well, that says a great deal about the importance of the Australian-Philippines relationship uh, because, you know, we've got this massive embassy here because this relationship really matters to us. You know, we're committed, we're here, we want to do more, we want to bring it even closer together than it is today. Um, and so I think we've got lots of opportunity. So for me, it's kind of a pleasure to be here and I kind of pinch myself each day when I get up. You know, is it true that I'm actually in the Philippines and I can do all of these things and come here and be with you and you know, go around and talk to so many people and try and boost what is already a very fine relationship. Well, I, I hope you get to visit some of our finer places. I mean, yeah. I Marawi is not on the bucket yeah. list well, you of, know, of anyone. I'm, I'm going to go back again. There's no Boracay. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get there. I'll get there. I've been to Bahol. I've been to Bahol. Okay. I thought that was magnificent. Okay. And I love Bahol. Um, I've been to Cebu a couple of times and you know, Cotabato and I went to Basilan. There you go. Really? Went to Basilan. You know, Basilan's got promise in the future. Um, Actually, it's, it's, it's a very nice place. place. It's just, it's just a security issue that's yeah, keeping it. But it's it. getting better. You yeah. know, and we were contributing to that. We've got a, yeah. we've got a program down there in Basilan that brings in uh, Abu Sayyaf surrenderees. And so I met 214 of them when I went down there a couple of months ago. That was quite an extraordinary day. But uh, you put all that together, you know, the place is just fascinating. It, it's interesting. I, yeah. I, I've noticed that you know uh, Australian tourists are some of the most intrepid. You know, yeah. I mean, they go to places where they do. Yeah, you know, no, people no, normally don't go. Yeah. But uh, in ASEAN, I think you know. To be fair, I think Indonesia and Thailand draw more. Yeah, I well, think. How I do think, you think the Philippines well, can 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 compete there? Well, what can we, be done? We were actually talking with our airlines yesterday because yeah. uh, the Qantas and. Jetstar offices here have just moved to a new office. Okay. Uh, so I actually was at the opening of that office last night. And we were talking about the potential for the future because right. the potential is really high. Right. Um, so, you know, Qantas is doing you know, uh, a flight each way a day. Right. You know, and there's 33 flights a week now between Australia and the oh, Philippines. Wow. Um, but we were talking to the Jetstar people about the potential for Cebu. Because if you go down to Cebu International Airport, it's world class. That is just fantastic. So it's as good as Hong Kong, as good as Singapore. And you walk through that airport and you think, now here's, here's a real gateway that uh -huh. would enable people to come from Australia or anywhere else in the world right. for that matter and then go off to all different parts of the Philippines right. and avoiding the, you know, the bustle the of... The mess in Manila. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the bustle of Manila, perhaps. Very diplomatic. Say. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> so, yeah, the bustle of Manila. Uh, but, you know, I think that's yeah. got enormous potential. Right. You know, and as, as people start to learn more about the Philippines and the, the places that you can go, because there's such variety, such diversity, um, I think, you know, the, the tourism industry is bound to increase. Uh, is that an Australian culture, I mean, the, the, or rites of passage, so, I mean, to speak, just to... So we uh, like to travel. You like to travel. And generally, right? we like to travel outside Australia rather than inside Australia. Okay. So I've travelled more around the world than I have in my own country, which is, <laughs> you know, but I'm not alone, you know, that's yeah. what Australians do. Yeah. We all say when you get really old, then you look, go and travel around Australia because right. you can't go overseas. Yeah. And what do we do? We are adventurous. We do like yeah. going to different places. Places. And so, you know, getting out to Southeast Asia is an economical way of seeing the world and exposing yourself to a whole range of different cultures. Right. And coming to the Philippines just makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, Australians have been drawn to Bali yeah. uh, and the 
and Indonesia, I think increasingly, particularly because of those people-to-people -people links, right. there will be more people coming They're to the Philippines. They're more curious. Yeah, and, and there's lots here that is pretty much untouched. Right. And where, when you're seeking to travel, you know, particularly when you're young, you want to go to places that haven't been turned into some cosmopolitan resort. That's true. You want to see something that's actually natural and beautiful. Right. Now, the Philippines has got all of that. Uh, well. Mm. I hope you get to enjoy some of that while you're, you're in Manila. Yeah, Don't well, work I'm too looking hard. forward to it. Uh, <laughs> it'll be good. Uh, so I'll eventually get out there. Okay. Well, thank you, Ambassador. A pleasure. Uh, I, I know you've been very busy. We've been no, working on this right. for a that's, long time. No, that's lovely. But, you know, maybe in the future when you have maybe a major development, or sure. keep us in mind. You know, we can, we'd be more than happy to do this uh, sort of roundtable interview again in the thank future. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity for us. So thank you very much. I've really enjoyed okay. it. Thank All right. you. All right. Pleasure. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> okay. Thanks.